Baobek Institute lecture series is organized jointly by the Leo Beck Institute and the German Historical Institute London. I'm therefore very, very happy to give way to Professor Christina von Hodenberg, the director of the German Historical Institute. Uh, yes, hello, um, just a very brief welcome from me. Um, we have a long-standing partnership um, as German Historical Institute in London with the Leo Beck Institute. And we normally have um, the lecture series, which we hold together um, at Bloomsbury Square in our beautiful building uh, of the German Historical Institute. We cannot be there, but I think we have to focus on the positives here. Um, and that is that many people who are far away from London can now take part in this wonderful lecture series. Um, I think this is the first virtual lecture that we have held together, Daniel. Um, yeah. And um, I think the turnout is wonderful. Um, and uh, I thank you all for coming. Uh, I really look forward to Paul Herzberg's lecture. I think he's maybe the first speaker that I do not only look forward to what he has to say, but also just to hearing his voice. And that is meant to be a compliment. Anyway, I pass um, uh, the uh, baton back to you, uh, Daniel, and you can introduce our speaker a little more in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. And my thanks go also out to you and the German Soul Institute. It's always a pleasure to work with you and we hope that soon, hopefully, probably in spring or maybe early summer, we again can come back to your beautiful institute. Acting Jewish between identity and hire is quite a political topic. And discussions about images of Jews and Judaism are always quite difficult discussions. Normally, we invite academics to give lectures. However, this time we thought to invite people who produce and work with images of Jews and Judaism. So I'm very glad that we got a brilliant actor on board, Paul Herzberg. What does it mean to play Jewish characters in front of a camera? Or what does it mean to play Jewish characters in front of a live audience? Paul Herzberg, has done both. Paul has had and still has a very lustrous career on stage, on TV and on the big screen too. Just to give you some few examples. He performed in The Honorable Woman, the famous BBC miniseries from 2014, set between London or the UK and Israel or he performed on Black Earth Rising, a co-production between the BBC and Netflix. Paul played Shimon Peres on stage in London in the award-winning play Oslo 2017. And of course he played Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. Paul is not only an actor, he's also a writer working for the theater and the screen. And he has written several award-winning stage plays and film strips. Not only his life and career is fascinating, also his family history. As some of you know, we, the Leo Beck Institute, have started during the first wave of Corona in spring, a new online series called Snapshots of German Jewish History and Culture. Snapshot number three, Heimat in the suitcase, is about Paul's family. Please feel free to make yourself familiar with the story of the Herzbergs on our website. A story which unfolds between Germany, South Africa, Cuba, the USA, and finally the United Kingdom. Paul's lecture will feature video clips and sound recordings and depending on your Wi-Fi connection, the sound might be at times slightly lacking behind the motion. We are sorry for this convenience and but this is what we have. For the duration of the talk, we will mute you and we are recording this event and will most likely make it available via podcast or YouTube afterwards. After Paul's lecture, we will have a Q&A session 
how this will work, the Q&A session, I will explain to you after Paul's lecture. Now, I'm very, very happy to say, Paul, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vilman. Uh, when Dr. Vilman kindly uh, asked me to be part of these talks, I have to admit to feeling puzzled by the opening words of the headline title. What does acting Jewish mean, I wondered? Did it denote a style of performance based on the alleged traits of global Jewry? Maybe it described some sort of innate behavior drawing on anthropological research, or was it perhaps linked to social convention forged by a strong cultural heritage? And the more I thought about the coupling of those two words, the more intriguing they became. Now, just to be clear, I'm not an academic, I'm a working actor and screenwriter with a rather unusual past and drawing on that tonight, I'll try to offer you a few reflections on what being Jewish has meant in my four decades in the entertainment industry and whether it's had any impact on me and my working life. And along the way, I'd like to refer to a few performance clips. Now the Leo Beck team have worked tirelessly to make these as clear as possible, but please bear with us in these strange times as they're mostly drawn from the internet, so the quality in one or two may seem a bit compromised. So before we get going, uh, a brief word on my background. My mother was from peasant stock, her parents having fled the Lithuanian pogroms around the turn of the last century. My father was German, the son of assimilated Hanoverians and a socialist from the age of 12. And uh, after a fallout with his Iron Cross winning father, the year that Hitler came to power in 1933, he was disinherited, taking refuge in the only country that would accept him at the time, South Africa. So I grew up in a secular home and came to this country 44 years ago, following my conscription into the Angolan border wall. So back to those two words, acting Jewish. Let's infer that they may suggest a style of performance one can encounter in the performing arts. So let's begin with the great actor's interpretation of an iconic role. I had the good fortune to work with Alec Guinness twice. Smiley's People in 1981, playing a young Russian acting as a courier for the KGB, then as the anti-Semitic Graciano in The Merchant of Venice, with Guinness in the role of Shylock at Chichester Festival Theatre, more of Shylock and Nom. Now Guinness was married to Merrila Salaman, who was Jewish. And it could be argued that his Fagin in the 1948 version of Oliver Twist was simply in step with the times, but I think it's worth viewing a clip of the film to see what acting Jewish still seemed to mean just after the Holocaust and how a great writer's vision of a character and in turn a great actor's approach in bringing it to life may nonetheless entrench lingering myths about Jewish behavior and physical appearance. Here he is, Fagin, my friend Oliver Twist. Very glad to see you, Oliver, very. Aren't we, my dears? Yeah. Yeah, how far have you come? I've been looking for seven days. Speak is a magistrate, my dear. Don't you take off the sausages. <coughs> Sit down, Oliver. <coughs> there are a great many of them, ain't there, my dear? Yes, sir. We've just looked them out ready for the wash. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you've been at work, Dodger. Oh. Good boy. Good boy. And free warps. Genius worker, ain't he, Oliver? Very indeed, sir. <laughs> You'd like to make pocket handkerchiefs as easily as the artful dodger, wouldn't you, my dear? Yes, if you teach me, sir. Thank you, my dear, we will. <laughs> to work, Terry, to work. So... Endeavoring to explore the subject more broadly, I'd like to mention my late father, whose writings I donated to the Leo Beck Institute. He was the oldest student in the world to get a degree and forced to leave school at the age of 15. 
hence his enduring passion for formal study. An anti-apartheid activist and political commentator, what drove him was a quest to make the world a better place. Now, this was notionally due to his left-wing politics. And yet, despite his atheism and the rejection of his ethnicity as something that defined him, I suspect it was his ordeal under the Nazis that had a major influence on his humanity and his physical courage in the face of prejudice. Aged 50, he was offered a major promotion. When he entered the new office, he found another man present who said, you will concentrate on the business side while I go out and press the flesh. And when my father demanded to know the reason, the man replied, the clubs most of our customers frequent don't admit Jews. My dad ripped up his contract and walked out. So identity can be about individual choice where choice is possible, but it can also be about perception and prejudice. And when it comes to Jewish identity, the subject is complex, given the tension between self-determination and the tox toxic myths that can impose identity. Acting Jewish, therefore, could also be seen as a set of libels tainting anyone who happens to be a Jew. And taken to its absurd conclusion, those with such views might attribute the same predilections to a Falasha girl in an Ethiopian village in 1920 and an elderly British rabbi in the present. And as my father knew, when such absurdity remains unchallenged, we submit to dangerous stereotype. But I think the question remains, what if anything is acting Jewish? Now I'm South African born. I grew up in a secular household. I attended a local school steeped in Christian tradition and I had no bar mitzvah. My parents insisted that I attend school on Jewish holidays and my teenage romances were mostly with non-Jewish girls. And yet, despite my father's refugee past and with two Jewish parents, I was still regarded as, as an anomaly and an outsider by much of the local Jewish community. So it could be argued that what constitutes acting Jewish in this instance, fitting conduct within a largely conventional community is also something that Jews may adopt to define themselves. I arrived in the United Kingdom in the mid seventies after my decision to leave South Africa, given my time as a conscript in the Angolan border war and as someone no longer willing to live under apartheid. In this bracingly new environment, what seemed to matter most was not my Jewishness, but the fact that I was South African. People often assumed I was sympathetic to apartheid simply because I was white. Again, a case of imposed identity, in this instance political, based entirely on a set of preconceptions. And I think it seems that the era we are now living through is inciting people to embrace such willful ignorance with racial and political stereotypes increasingly rife, none more so than in the new front line of politics, social media. Right, let's take a more detailed look at the entertainment industry. No other Jewish character has provoked as much controversy as Shakespeare's Shylock. While more than 50 years ago, Laurence Olivier dispensed with the standard false beak and whining shtetl brogue often used to portray the role, opting instead for a formidable set of false teeth and self-consciously noble diction. His Rothschild inspired Shylock, hailed as a nuanced take on the role, still sparked criticism for drawing on stereotype. And yet Shylock, it could be argued, demands that of any actor, however inventive you are and however compassionate about Jewish suffering, you can't escape the text. So, here is Laurence Olivier in Jonathan Miller's 1968 production of The Merchant of Venice as he meets Solerio and Solanio in a scene which contains the oft quoted hath not a Jew eyes speech. Hath not a Jew eyes. Hath not a Jew hands, organs. Dimensions, senses, affections, passions. If you prick us, do we not bleed? Tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? 
And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Why? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be? By Christian example. Why? Villainy, you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard. But I will better the instruction. So in 2007, I was cast as Shylock in a production at the Arcola Theatre. Now, the director's vision really appealed to me. She felt that Shylock should be assimilated, tough, devoid of a Yiddish accent, with no choice but to retaliate against the raging prejudice around him while battling to save his daughter from the clutches of a fickle Venetian society. And of course, the play is often the subject of fierce debate centered on whether it's anti-Semitic or not. And alas, there's not enough time to explore that in depth tonight. But I'd like to offer you my three experiences of having done it. As Solerio in a Lambda production at the Ellen Terry Theater, as the Jew-hating Graciano with Alec Guinness as Shylock in Chichester, and finally, as Shylock himself at the Arcola. Now, each production was distinctive, each Shylock highly individual, yet while my portrayal may have differed from precedent, the response from the audience was identical each time when it came to Shylock's retribution at the hands of Portia, extended terms of which are offered to his enemy Antonio, namely confiscation of his fortune and the renunciation of his faith by becoming a Christian. In three varying productions, in different venues, and with diverse audiences, the glee that Shylock had received such harsh punishment was palpable each time. And it reinforced my belief that while it's a great play, The Merchant of Venice promotes the ancient parody of the miserly, vengeful Jew. The two most notable Jewish characters in English literature, after all, are Fagin and Shylock. The non-iambic, hath not a Jew, I speech that we just heard Olivier deliver with such zeal is often cited as Shakespeare's compassion for the plight of Jews. And yet, it could also be argued that it's simply a master playwright offering his audience something that makes for a strong antagonist, a compelling argument. Or put more simply, the devil always has the best tunes. So Arnold Wesker, a fierce critic of the play, went further in his publicized spat with John Gross, a British scholar, and I, a scholar, excuse me, and I quote, It is generally accepted that the strongest evidence supporting the view that Shakespeare didn't create a stereotype are the famous lines that he gives the otherwise relentlessly cruel Jew to plead his humanity. Few, not even gross, challenge that speech itself or the way it is perceived. For him, as for everyone else, it is a noble piece of writing, not for me. I hear those widely trumpeted lines as self-pitying, patronizing and deeply offensive. As Cynthia Ozick observed, the same could be claimed for a monkey. Far from vindicating the play, they betray it, reveal its central flaw. Implied within them is medieval Christian arrogance that assumed the right to confer or withdraw humanity as it saw fit. So returning to the subject of choice when approaching this role, in the next two clips, I will attempt first to show how acting Jewish can influence perception of a character Firstly, by embracing the physical, vocal, and moral characteristics commonly ascribed to Shylock. Then secondly, unfettered by racial bias. So imagine, if you will, Shylock number one, bearded with a deferential gait, long pious, a giant hooked nose, and invariably speaking in a Yiddish accent. Now, while all these traits may not appear in every rendition, And while many actors, Jew and non-Jew alike, have attempted to portray Sherlock in as human a way as possible, I've seldom seen a performance without at least one of them. But first, some images of the character to show how he is often represented in art. To um, set the scene, Antonio, merchant uh, of the title, 
has fallen on hard times. Surrounded by his privileged friends, he confesses to melancholy, seemingly due to the loss of his ships at sea. When his beloved Bassanio announces that he is unable to woo Portia without a great dowry, Antonio vows to act as guarantor. And later, when Antonio sees Bassanio attempting to get a loan off Shylock, he intercedes, mocking Shylock's character and dealings, likening him to the devil. And so, Shylock's response, version one, the Jewish stereotype, followed by version two, an assimilated Venetian. Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto, you have hated me about my monies and my use and sense. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever. Cut throat dog and spit upon my Jewish gabardine and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to them. You come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have money. You say so. You that did void your room upon my beard and foot me as you spell my strange occur over your threshold. Money's is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say of a dog? Money? Is it possible a cur can lend three thousand ducats? Or shall I bend low in a bondsman's key with weighted breath and whispering humble to say this? Fair sir, you spat on me on Wednesday last. You spared me such a day. Another time you called me dog, and for these courtesies, I lend you thus much monies? Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon my Jewish cavadee, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then, you come to me and you say, Shylock! We would have monies. You say so. You, that it void your room upon my beard and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, have a dog money? Is possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or shall I bend low and in a bondsman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this? Fair sir, you spat on me on Wednesday last. You spend me such a day. Another time you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I lend you thus much monies? So, Despite my take on the role and the valiant attempts of the director to portray Shylock in a compassionate light, he remains, for me, at best, someone who may have suffered persecution, may have lost his fortune and daughter, may have been forced to become a Christian, but is always remembered as an outsider who worshipped prophet and resolved, and was resolved rather vengefully to cut out his pound of flesh. Now, if I look at what acting Jewish means in the day-to-day -day world, I'm reminded that sometimes Jews may attempt to refute a negative stereotype by fighting against it. So some context for personal experience. Several South African politicians were interned for their Nazi sympathies during World War II, one of whom became state president, a man I played in Anthony Scher's ID at the Almeida, the notorious John Forster. During apartheid, all young white men were subject to conscription and at 18, I was sent to one of the toughest military camps in the country where the handful of Jewish soldiers was often victimized. 
Now, I was determined to not only stand up for, us, for myself, but march better, shoot straighter, work harder, and show how tough I was in unarmed combat, and perilously sometimes to engage in arguments about apartheid. Unwittingly, I found myself defending my fellow Jews, and I became the obsessive focus of a Hitler-worshipping Afrikaner who was unable to reconcile me with his bias, despite never having met a Jew before. He kept saying to me, you must surely be an Afrikaner Jew. And I used that experience as raw material in a screenplay 45 years later. And my time in the army as a young man brought it home that vile traits resistant to history and social interaction are often associated with the Jews. And of course, during apartheid, absurd stereotyping was aimed at mixed race people, Asians, and in particular Africans. Uh, the latter seen as indolent, intellectually inferior, and innately savage. On Robben Island, where Mandela was incarcerated for 27 years, prisoners saw it differently, a place where intellectuals were imprisoned by imbeciles. At university, I forged a friendship with a mixed race actor based on our mutual loathing of racism. You may know Vincent Ebrahim inter alia as the father in the Kumars number 42. And if we are exploring how stereotype is used to whip up racism, I'd like to quote him if I may. This is Vincent. I was no older than seven or eight when I recall hearing the term color bar used with vituperative passion in the conversations of adults in my home. I wasn't sure of its meaning, but picked up its pejorative connotations from the angry tones of my father and his associates during these debates. I was learning that color bar was a euphemism for syst systematic humiliation of people of color and denial of basic human rights by an ideology based on white supremacism. Right, returning to the performing arts, there is also the question of seeming Jewish through one's name and fear that it may prove to be a handicap, a professional one. A notable exception being Karen Elaine Johnson who changed her name to Whoopi Goldberg. And when I graduated from Lambda, I was interviewed by a top agent. While he was keen to represent me, he said, have you thought about changing your name? It's a bit, you know. I let that hang in the air and then I said, yes, I have, to Paul Rabinovitz. Looking at those who were more pragmatic, Winona Ryder, Winona Horowitz, Jerry Lewis, Joseph Levitch, and my favorite one, Natalie Portman, Netta Herschlag. The choice to change one's name surely emerges from a desire to either thwart preconceptions or pander to the view that only Anglo-Saxon or non-Jewish sounding surnames carry less baggage. So, the story goes that when the young Tony Curtis, nay Schwartz, met the powerful agent Swifty Lazar in Hollywood, he was given the following advice. You won't get anywhere with a name like Schwartz, not even George Bernard Schwartz. So I've played a vast array of characters in my 40 years as an actor, a Palestinian activist, uh, an SS major, a gay Brazilian chef, a Polish American wild man, the Randy houseboy Garcia in Life and Loves of a She-Devil, and recently a British war crime, crimes prosecutor of Turkish extraction in the BBC serial Black Earth Rising. And I think what these roles have in common is that none of them is British. So what determined my casting? Was it my colonial past, my surname, my brown, brownish hair and eyes? Was it the narrow perception of British male bearing and countenance? Whatever it was, being Jewish seemed to have little impact on my casting until recently. Now, I have played a few Brits and began my career as a young English art historian in one of the first tales of the unexpected, pointing to the fact that ideally one's ethnicity should have little impact on how one is cast, or as I'll come to later, neither should it be magnanimously ignored. So here's a clip from 1978, and please bear in mind that this is me 42 years ago. As a house guest, Mr. Bannister, you leave a lot to be desired. Do I? Hmm. Beating your hostess at bridge. Jack's furious. And then locking your door. So 
such ingratitude. Besides, I have a key to every bedroom in this house. All 47 of them. 47. Striped pajamas. I'm cold-blooded. Oh. oh. And a bow. How sweet. How old-fashioned. Just uh, think of this as your bread and butter letter, darling. Written in a box. Oh. Forgive me, lady. I thought I heard an intruder. You are the intruder, Jax. Could I be of any service to you, sir? Um, no, I'm... Go away, Jax! Hearing strange sounds, I took the precaution of alerting Sir Basil, my lady. As a butler, Jax, you'd make a perfect baby minder. I hope I've been of some service, sir. I suppose so, yes. If I might suggest it, a chair braced firmly under the doorknob is quite the best deterrent. Her ladyship has been known to sleepwalk before dawn. Good night, Jokes. Good night, sir. So, this series initially was based on the writings of Roald Dahl. And there I was, a Jew playing a non-Jew, opposite Joan Collins, a half-Jew playing a non-Jew, in an adaptation of a story penned by a known anti-Semite who I quote, this is Roald Dahl. There is a trait in the Jewish character that does provoke animosity. Maybe it's a kind of lack of generosity towards non-Jews. I mean, there's always a reason why anti-anything crops up anywhere. Even a stinker like Hitler didn't just pick on them for no reason. I mean, if you and I were in a line moving towards what we knew were gas chambers, I'd rather have a go at taking one of the guards with me. But they, the Jews, were almost always submissive. In my late 50s, things changed. It may have been connected to a shift in global politics where Israel-Palestine became uh, an increasing focus spawning many dramas centered on conflict in the Middle East. In 2012, I was cast in Honeypot as a Mossad officer in the first half of the play and in the second, his target, a Palestinian activist. It demanded of me that I research the conflict in the Middle East for a deeper understanding of the play. And what I discovered, again, confounded stereotype on both sides. The same year I was cast as Dr. Luni Schutzmacher in The Doctor's Dilemma at the National Theatre. I was already a fan of Shaw, having played Blunchley in Arms and the Man at the Royal Exchange. So here is a, a brief clip, the sound rather poor, of me as Schutzmacher and Malcolm Sinclair as Sir Colenso Ridgen discussing the dubious Mr. Dubidat a shawl brings the subject of Jews and money together. It was what I said about the drawings that really pleased him. <laughs> he also said that his wife was greatly struck with my knowledge and that she always admired Jews. Then he asked me to advance him 50 pounds for security. <laughs> So while the character of Schutzmacher seemed sympathetic, I was dismayed to discover that Shaw, like several other eminent writers, had penned something inescapably anti-Semitic. To quote but one, Shaw. No doubt Jews are obnoxious creatures. Any competent historian or psychoanalyst can bring a mass of incontrovertible evidence to prove that it would have been better for the world if the Jews had never existed. Now, the seeming 
contradiction between accomplished writers on the one hand and their disturbing views on the other opens up the vexing subject. Should someone's racism negate their body of work? The following year, Hugo Blick cast me as the Israeli ambassador in The Honorable Woman. And when the show was broadcast, it was the height of the Gaza war. And I had this eerie sense of life and art overlapping. Again, I was forced to reflect on the intersection of my ethnicity with the character I was playing. We have absolutely no knowledge of the group operating within your university, none. You know, there are moments in a diplomat's career, Daniel, when the only thing to do is just to tell it straight. We have absolutely no knowledge of the mm, Is it also operating. your policy to allow military veterans into universities at the expense of Israeli Arabs? We have absolutely no... Would you fucking shut up! Is that how it is? To tell it straight? <sighs> no. This is how it is. I've been set up as some kind of a front, haven't I? Seven years ago by your government and my brother and you've both colluded to make sure that I never found out. We have I haven't absolutely. finished now that I have found out. This is what you're going to do about it. One, your government will continue to support the Stein Group in all its activities. From now on, there will be no preferment policy in any institution to which my name is attached. Two. As we speak, our entire cable network is being swept and that will continue with your government's full support. Three, if for whatever reason this happens in the future, it doesn't matter what you do or what you say, you will be doing it in public because that's the stage I'll be on. And believe me, I'm very good on a public stage. <clears throat> now you can speak. Your claim would damage you more than us, no matter what. Do you want to put that to the test? Because believe me, I've got nothing else to lose. So in 2017, I was offered the roles of Yair Hirschfeld and Shimon Peres in the award-winning play Oslo for the National. Uh, Whatever one's feelings about the Oslo Accords, the foresight of the Norwegian diplomats who brought the Israeli and Palestinian negotiating teams together was to insist that once the hard talk had finished, that the men ate, drank and socialized together and confined their talk to everyday or familial matters. And preconceptions on both sides gradually melted away and they found much common ground with friendships lasting to the present day, despite the absence of a conclusive peace. January 1993, the official opening of the unofficial Oslo Channel. I am facilitating secret conversations between the State of Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization. We see you as a savage. But out here, we will light the fire, share our needs, talk about families. Because if you succeed, you'll change the world. Whether my recent consistent casting as a Jew is coincidental or something more complex, I'm still trying to work out. Whatever it is, I spent 40 years as a professional actor not thinking about my Jewish roots. However, recently I've been forced into some introspection fueled by the spike in global anti-Semitism. And so this brings us back full circle. If an accepted notion of nefarious behavior is expected of you because of your ethnicity, you are forced to respond. And this may mean an unconscious move by me towards this sort of role and this sort of work, where Jewish identity is woven into the narrative but avoids stereotype. To me, any form of discrimination, whether based on racial science, blind ignorance or political manipulation is vile and should be resisted at all costs. As a writer, I've often tackled the oppression of black or mixed race people in my scripts. But this talk has made me look back over my work and I found that within some of those narratives, there seems to be an unconscious lingering motif, whatever the central focus, 
there is often a passing reference to Jewish identity. In my BBC radio play, The Song of My Father, I focused on a young conscript who was the marching puppet of his retired sergeant father. Ray Kemp is forced to face his conscience and break free of the army, his sadistic instructor and his overbearing father when a close friend commits suicide. And that character played by Alan Corduna is Jewish. In my radio play, Dreaming Up Laura with Bill Nye and the late Sheila Gish, a middle-aged woman in an unhappy marriage and suffering from early onset Alzheimer's finds that the only way she can access her youth is through the dream diary she kept as a teenager. That idea is suggested to her by her cousin who is half Jewish, played by Henry Goodman, a man shunned by her largely Gentile family. My play, The Dead Weight, produced at the market, the Royal Exchange and the Park, based loosely on my experiences in the Angolan War, focuses on an unlikely bond between a young white conscript and the wounded black freedom fighter he's forced to carry back to the border through war-torn Angola by his sadistic commanding officer, and then at the 11th hour is ordered to execute. Jack? And we turn to our ancestors and together, we talk to the dead. Ina, bagomuse koshe. Basi give kwa ne ebelu buti sa imani. Ina, ina basi. Ina, olonze lweni osi endala. Engeni sengo tingo lweni sazana. Ina, bago sisi. So George, the freedom fighter, and Josh, the white soldier who you just saw, discover something in common, a factor in their growing closeness. George's young daughter left behind in London has the same name as Josh's late grandmother, both called Lily. It emerges that Josh's grandmother was Jewish as he reminisces to George. Dad's lot, they couldn't stand her, this crazy old creature, this ultra Yiddish lady, swamped by wasps. Know what they called us? Us Gilmores. Vances. Named for a bug. Twice I saw a vance on the wall. Only thing she passed on to yours truly. Fear of bugs. Big blonde bastard like me. So it seems that I'd been unconsciously compelled to include Jewish themes even if they were not at the forefront of the story. Now, returning to the casting of the Honourable Woman in Oslo, Maggie Gyllenhaal, lead in the former, is half Jewish, playing a Jew. Andy Bucken, as a brother, is Gentile, playing a Jew. Philip Arditi, the lead Palestinian role, is a Turkish Jew in Oslo. Peter Polycarpo, a Brit of Cypriot extraction, played the main Palestinian role. And this, to me, is how casting should be. Best actor for the job, whatever their ethnicity. But unfortunately, Casting is often commercially driven, subjective, or determined by unconscious prejudice. And I think there is still much work to do in offering black, Asian, and mixed race actors the same opportunities as their white counterparts. I'd like to quote Vincent Ebrahim again on this briefly. I struggle to comprehend the phrase colorblind casting. It implies a system that must consciously blind itself to somebody's pigmentation in order to consider whether they can play some character or another. 
what or who is the entity that imbues itself with the power to make this judgment? To be subject to this magnanimity leaves me feeling that I'm part of a quota to be fulfilled. I'm an actor from a very diverse background. I want to feel the confidence to bring that diversity into the room and not have it ignored. So I'd like to conclude by mentioning a screenplay I was commissioned to write which won a place on the 2018 Brit list. It was based on the life of Anka Kauder, a young Czech who grew up in a secular household in Prague. And come the Nazi invasion, Czech Jews were subjected to the same treatment as their German counterparts. So Anka found herself along with her parents and husband in Theresienstadt. Somehow she and her husband managed to see each other despite the sectioning off of the camp along the lines of gender. After two years, he was sent to Auschwitz. At the time, inmates of Theresienstadt knew little of what was going on in the East, as it was called by the SS. Yet so bereft was Anka, she volunteered to be sent there. She never saw her husband again, but in Auschwitz, she discovered that she was pregnant. Her time there was mercifully brief. Alongside another 150 Czech women, she was selected by Joseph Mengele to go to a slave labor camp in Freiburg in Germany where they needed workers with small hands to rivet tail fins, fins uh, I beg your pardon, to rivet tail fins onto flying bombs or V1s. And over the next six months, she hid her pregnancy from the Nazis, despite her swelling stomach and her increasingly emaciated body. As the Russians were liberating Auschwitz, Anka, along with others, was sent away from Freiburg on a coal truck, part of a long train to they knew not where. So the journey took three weeks and weighing 95 pounds, surrounded by the dying, Anka finally arrived in Austria at a place as notorious as Auschwitz. On the shock of seeing the words Mauthausen sent her into labor and she gave birth to a baby girl at its gates. A day later, the Americans liberated the camp and miraculously the baby survived. Anka lived to 95 years old, dying in 2013. Her daughter, Eva Clark, works for the Holocaust Memorial Trust. I interviewed Anka and there was an embarrassment of riches to draw on, but I struggled at first on how I would approach my central character. And when I asked her why she thought she'd survived, she said she just kept her head down yet. Many decisions she'd made seemed to contradict that. She'd shown defiance, courage and resilience in the face of unimaginable cruelty. And even at 95, there was still a fire in her, a great charm and a, a toughness that suggested how she'd managed to get through those really appalling years. In attempting to honor her story, I used a simple driving idea that despite the surrounding death, what kept her going was the growing life inside her. So nothing could crush her, neither the appropriation of her country by the Nazi juggernaut nor the imprisonment in four concentration camps or even the loss of her entire family. Anka defied this toxic stereotype imposed on Jews by the Nazis. She showed a strength to survive and protect her baby that was almost superhuman. And using that, I found a way to navigate the story. While there is undoubtedly a Jewish sense of humor that draws on irony, self-deprecation and wordplay, and there are possibly certain social or linguistic quirks that may point to a kind of Western Jewishness. Given the diaspora and presence of Jews in over 100 countries, including Taiwan, Jamaica, and Uzbekistan, to ascribe common behavioral traits to an entire people is absurd. Last year, I attended a talk by the writer of Call Me By Your Name, an Egyptian-born Jew, Andre Asiman, who said something that has really stayed with me. If you're born a Jew at some stage, you have to pay the price. And it echoes the idea that identity and behavior of an entire people isn't always down to self-determination. So in conclusion, all I can say is this, the only aspect of Jewishness that I think may be common to global Jewry is something not visible, something where one may never encounter in day-to-day -day behavior, a deep sense of survival, born of history. I'd like to end, if I may, on a lighter note with a clip from Frazier as he tries to con a prospective Jewish mother-in-law about his ethnic credentials. So, Frazier, you grew up in Seattle? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Such a pretty city. Oh, huh? 
I guess you were bar mitzvahed here. Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> what a proud day that was. <laughs> I can still remember reading from the Torah before the, the rabbi and the <laughs> cantor and uh, the moil. The moil? <laughs> the one who did your circumcision? Yes, yes, I just wanted to show him that there were no hard feelings. <laughs> Right. If anyone would like to raise any points, we can open things up for an informal discussion. So over to Dr. Wildermann. Thank you, Paul, very, very much for this extremely fascinating, very rich and very impressive lecture and performances. And I'm sure there are a lot of questions out there. Now, how do we go about? It's very simple. If you would like to ask the speaker, Paul, a question, please write your name, just your name, in the chat box and press return so that we can find you on screen and can unmute you. You can see the chat function in the um, menu bar at the bottom of your screen. So off we go and we wait for your questions. Maybe I could come in with the first question already until you send in your name. Paul, I mean, what was kind of extremely interesting to hear is then when staying on stage, playing, for example, um, Shylock, you kind of feel these reactions from your live audience. And whatever you do, you said that the, the reactions were kind of similar, which was not meant to be something which you liked very much. So how can you come to terms with these reactions while being on stage playing, for example, Shylock? Um, I think uh, there are quite a few actors on this thread, I think, and I think they will all understand that ideally when you are deeply immersed in a role, it's very, it's, it's a bit perilous to start making objective uh, observations about how your audience is reacting. But I think unlike in any other performance, on, as I said, on these occasions, especially playing Shylock at the Arcola and especially at Chichester Festival Theatre, um, I inadvertently stepped out of my role because I was so focused on the audience reaction, this palpable glee when Shylock uh, receives his comeuppance. And interestingly, um, just before we came on air, as it were, I was doing a bit of research and there's an article about a Berliner Ensemble production where they actually consciously cast Shylock to look as Aryan as possible. So he was virtually indistinguishable from Antonio. And in, she, Cynthia Ozick says in exactly the same way at the point where there's this retribution against Shylock, and he's excommunicated and he loses his fortune, there was this glee in the audience. It might not have manifested itself as applause, but it was really palpable. And that was the thing that, that I think shocked me each time. Would you go on playing Shylock? <laughs> um, I mean, interestingly, in, in the production that we did at the Arcola, Julia Pascal, uh, did some tinkering with the text and she attempted to offer a new context to the play to mitigate the idea of a, a grossly anti-Semitic character and it sort of worked but I, I, I think you know as I said in uh, earlier on you can't escape that text mm -hmm. I think if I were ever to be offered the role again which might be a possibility I would have to think really hard about doing it because I've now got serious as great as the play is, and as lyrical as the play is, I've got great concerns about the message it sends about Jewish Jewishness. We have two questions coming up, one from Christina von Hodenberg and the other one from Rainer Lieke. So maybe Christina first. Well, I think that um, probably ties in with what you said last, uh, Paul. And I wanted to ask you whether you've ever had the situation that um, you said to somebody who offered you a role, you know, I don't want this role because I am supposed to act 
um, in a too stereotypically Jewish way, or I won't play this character unless um, you don't give me this kind of attire. Have, has there ever been a situation like this? No, curiously, there hasn't. And, and in fact, I've encountered, this is slightly going off topic, I've encountered virtually no anti-Semitism at all in the performing arts. And it's only really in the last four or five years, and for, you know, I'm now 67, and, and uh, from the time of about 57 or 58, where I've played Jewish characters, and, and fortunately, except for Shylock maybe, none of them have, have confronted me with a situation where I felt I was taking on something that was highly stereotypical. So it's really only Shylock, you know, and that also poses a dilemma for non-Jewish actors as well. So mm. mercifully, I haven't been confronted by that yet. Rainer Liedke, please, next question. Ah, okay, now. Yes, thank you. That was a fascinating lecture. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to, I mean, I, I just one observation. Um, I was thinking while you were saying about um, a very well made film, uh, Munich by Steven Spielberg, where all the assassins, I, I think, who, uh, I mean, the Jewish Mossad um, induced assassins who killed off the Palestinian uh, terrorists um, from, from the Munich Olympics massacre were non-Jewish actors. So, uh, or maybe I think one had a Jewish father or something like that. So, I mean, it, it, and then many other characters come to mind, like Robert De Niro in Goodfellas, for example, played a Jewish casino, um, not owner, but, but manager was distinctly Jewish, but De Niro isn't. So there are, there are many counter examples, I think. But my, my question, and as a historian really, comes um, um, when you, you mentioned um, the evolution of Shylock into someone who could also be distinctly non-Jewish, optically at least, and accent-wise. Do you think there is, in general, in show business, in, in arts, in films, maybe an evolution or a particular time when there is a swing towards doing that? Or is it only Shylock specific? Is there maybe in the 70s, in the 80s or 90s, a time when, uh, when people um, writing plays or directing plays or films stop casting uh, or, or stop depicting Jewish characters as, let's say, typically Jewish uh, while they're still knowledge of I mean, people realize they are Jewish, like Shylock is definitely Jewish, but they, they stop um, with the accent, they stop with the gesturing and the long noses and things like that. Do, do you think that's, that's obvious or is it just random? I, I think since the 70s, I, I, I think in the last, especially in the last 10 years or so, there's generally um, a sense from screenwriters uh, and playwrights that ethnicity should not ever be approached stereotypically. Uh, but having said that, you know, we're also living, a slight digression, but I think it's material, we're living through an age where uh, all sorts of stereotypes are being resurrected again. But, but I, funnily enough, I came across rather an interesting quote about non-Jews playing Jews, which goes back to your central point. Ruth Bader Ginsburg recently died and a biopic has come out uh, depicting her life and there was some consternation because Felicity Jones, uh, um, who's not Jewish, was cast uh, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And the casting director who actually seems rather bright and perceptive, I think made quite a cogent point. I'll just read it to you. She said, the question isn't can Felicity Jones play a Jew? The question is, can she play this Jew? And I think that was quite an important point. And apparently Ruth Bader Ginsburg felt that Felicity Jones uh, captured the role uh, absolutely perfectly. So I go back to my point again. Um, I think that in, certainly in casting, which addresses your earlier point, it's the best person for the role, as long as casting is never uh, informed by prejudice or subjective. I don't know if that fully answers your question. David Cohen, you are online. Can you unmute yourself, David Cohen? Yeah. Try again. David, you're still muted. Oh, there you are. Great. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Paul. That was utterly compelling, brilliantly put together, and um, I was fascinated from beginning to end. Um, I just wondered, uh, in terms of the sort of different tropes of Jew and stereotypes, uh, you spoke quite a lot about it with Shylock and Fagan, which would be the sort of schnorrer or money grabbing type of Jew. I wondered about the other depictions, the sort of starker, the starker Jew, the strong man Jew, um, and also the, the type of um, Schlemiel Jew that maybe Woody Allen type, uh, Woody Allen plays. And then also the, do we see many depictions of Jews as mensches, the, the real positive um, effort, um, uh, manifestation of, of Jewish identity, both from within Judaism and, and from without? I think there is a move to make, um, certainly I, I can't immediately cite any examples, but there are quite a few examples uh, in Hollywood where Jewishness, for example, is coincidental to a role where there are heroic qualities and the character happens to be a Jew or the heroic qualities and the character happens to be black. In terms of the kind of Woody Allen genre, <laughs> of, of, of uh, stories. I mean, I'm not particularly uh, offended by that. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to answer your question, David. I mean, I just, I just think that as wide a range as possible of Jewishness is absolutely f fine to be depicted as long as there are not stereotypical caricatures. And for example, if you just moving outside theater and cinema, if you go onto YouTube at the moment, and we're talking about stereotypes, and you put in the word Jew, you'll be shocked what comes up. There is so much stuff out on, on the internet at the moment, which restores the, the kind of vituperative image of, of the Jewish character, the Sturme image, you know, um, of the eternal Jew with the giant hooked nose and all the Shylockian qualities. So the strong Jew or the stumbly Jew, I've got no problem with. It's that, particularly that caricature that, that really irks me. Do you think, just following on from that, that there is a comfort um, amongst Jews, and I'm thinking here of, 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 of Woody Allen and also um, um, uh, the uh, Seinfeld and um, those sort of things, Curb Your Enthusiasm, of a sort of a comfort with being self-deprecating, of sort of running ourselves down, and that, in a sense, is part of acting Jewish, um, rather than affirming um, positive qualities. Yes, I think so. And in fact, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of lost it now. Where is it? There was there was a lovely quote from Kirk Doug Douglas, and he said, "The only advantage of of being Jewish is that you can be openly anti-Semitic," and. <laughs> I think, you know, this idea of, of sublimating identity or forestalling criticism by being eternally self-deprecating or, or second-guessing comments that people might make is an unfortunate manifestation of, of, especially of urban Jewishness, that you protect yourself by landing the first blow against yourself. So, yeah. Thank you. There are some more questions, first from Holly, and then from Team Cornwell, and then Tiki Martel. Let's first start with Holly, and then Team Cornwell. Hello. Um, yes, this is kind of related to um, what was being spoken about earlier in terms of casting. I, I saw online recently something about a, um, a, a television show, I can't remember what it was called, that was being casted. Um, and it had a lot of um, Jewish characters in it, but the cast so far had been, had been non-Jewish. And there, someone had commented on the article saying um, that this was sort of equivalent to whitewashing. I don't know if you've kind of heard that term before, but it's sort of the same as, say, um, casting 
a white person to place a character who's not supposed to be white or casting someone with lighter skin. And yeah, I and that um, casting someone who isn't Jewish as a Jewish character should be treated in the same way, which I found, yeah, a fairly surprise, an interesting argument and a fairly surprising one. And um, this is also a second thing. Have you seen the, um, there's a, the sitcom Upstart Crow about Shakespeare and the, the episode in which he writes, um, in which he writes A Merchant of Venice and which he, and his sort of, um, the problems he has with the actor's portrayal of Shylock. I, I haven't seen that, uh, unfortunately, otherwise I'd be, be very happy to address it. Yes, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that there is some controversy about the show you're talking about. And, and just to, to reiterate my, my point, because I knew this, you know, right, rightfully would come up, as long as casting is not, for me at least, subjective or, or, or excluding or driven by racial bias, I have no problem with eight non-Jewish actors playing eight Jewish roles, as long as somebody hasn't said, we can't have any Jews here. You know, I think it's got, it's got to be the best actor for the role. The exception, I would say, is in terms of content and material. And I think rightfully black, Asian and mixed race actors are, are have been angry about the fact that there has not been enough material for them to get to grips with. And this is why, and, and again, I agree with it, there has been quite, conscious casting sometimes. Uh, there was a, um, a, was it Shaw? It was Wilde. It was an Oscar Wilde play in which a black actor was cast and there was a lot of controversy around that. And I think people have to be given a chance. So as long as casting is not driven by prejudice, I don't care who plays the role. And I think there needs to be more content for people who have been hitherto excluded from the casting process. Okay, Tim Cornwell is hi. next. Oh, um, hi there. Um, hi, Paul. I was just going to ask about um, women. We've talked a lot about Shylock and Fagan, and I was just kind of thinking about kind of Jewish women and how they're portrayed. I, I was thinking about the, um, uh, the the kind of neurotic girlfriend in Friends, mm -hmm. um, and uh, are they are they always kind of neurotic? Is there always are women Jewish women always portrayed as being neurotic and needy? I don't know. I'm just thinking about women in films that I've seen, and I was just wondering if that was the case, and is that a sort of another stereotype? Y yes, I, I I think it is. I think sometimes archetypes or stereotypes archetypes. Uh, which is a little less pejorative than a stereotype, are useful for a writer in to, to telegraph things about character very quickly. I, I think if, if, if the portrayal of Jewish characters is always simply confined to a certain set of characteristics, it blurs, it blurs identity. I mean, a, 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 you know, as I was saying, a, a Yemeni Jewish woman growing up in a very small farming community is going to have absolutely nothing in common with a, with a neurotic uh, girl growing up in the Bronx. From, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so um, that was that was the one. What was the other point that you raised, Anna? No, I was just I was just saying that that I think um, I'm thinking back of all the films I've seen, it tends to always you know there is that American J Jewish neurotic psychotherapist, slightly needy, or or else I suppose there's more in Lipman as well, you know, but but maybe her characters are more nuanced or Mira Margulies. I was just trying to think about the women and how they're portrayed and if there's- yes, I, I, I think it's a very good point. Uh, uh, and, and I think that anything in terms of, it's also the writer's responsibility to create a character, which the yeah. can then take on. I think anything that points to the superficial aspects of ethnicity, mm. if that is thumped home all the time, you lose a perspective on, on you know, on the overall sense of what a people can be. So I, I, I'm not entirely happy with that. Mm. It can be useful sometimes. Interestingly, Tracy Ann Oberman, who's a Jewish actress or actor, is about to play Shylock. Oh, really? Yeah. And she says that her interpretation will be entirely fueled by her prejudice, by the pre prejudice that she's encountered. You know, she uh, was in a, in a huge Twitter spat with Jeremy Corbyn during the, the, the you know, the whole yeah. anti-Semitism yeah. crisis with Labour. So 
it'll be interesting to see that she's a woman taking on a role which has all those, you know, all that controversy surrounding. Where is that happening? Where's where's that? Imminently, I believe. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'll email you. Oh yeah, do do. I'd like to see that. I like to, I like to see that too. Email me too. All right. <laughs> Then the next on the line is Tiki Martel. Wait, we have to unmute you, Tiki. Wait a sec. Luca, can you unmute Tiki Martel? Tiki, you have to unmute yourself. Do you see the sign? No. It's gone back to mute again. Tiki, you have to unmute. Okay, maybe take someone else and then we go, we get back to Tiki. Alex, Gail is, Alex. Yeah, hi there, Paul. Hi. Um, really interesting talk. I, I, I just wonder whether, um, unless I kind of missed it, but um, I hadn't really kind of touched on the, the, the subject, which has really driven so much in terms of I hesitate to use the word entertainment, but in terms of drama and films and television series and books, which of course is the Second World War and specifically the Holocaust. And you know, the, the Second World War, as you know, is a, a subject I write about from a fiction point of view, where I, I found it's, it's extremely difficult, even if you're right, you're setting out and saying, well, this isn't a Jewish book, there aren't Jewish characters. It's almost impossible not to, because to ignore that, the Jewish dimension of things not even directly to do with the Holocaust in the Second World War is almost a form of um, Holocaust denial. And I'm just wondering how much you think that the Holocaust and the events of the Second World War in Europe has driven the way Jewish characters have been portrayed. Uh, and I, 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 don't know, I, I don't know the answer to this. I'm interested in what you're saying, but a few people have um, re referred to Woody Allen, for instance, which is an e interesting subject to raise. And I just wonder whether, had the Holocaust not taken place, what, what his character would be like. Um, I don't know, I just, saw it, I just saw it open. I just kind of, I'm just interested to see how, how it drives things. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I a couple of filmmakers on this thread, they might have something to say about that. Um, I think the Holocaust has to have, a significant, significant extent influenced how Jewish characters are portrayed, uh, especially the post-war period, the 50s, 60s, 70s, going into the 80s, not, not as victims, but as, as people who have been oppressed or who are suffering the manifestations of oppression, even if they've not been directly affected by the Second World War. There's a whole thing of, of inherited trauma and epigenetics, etc. But I, I think I, I'm getting the sense that there is a move away from that. And whatever one's feelings about, about uh, you know, Israel and the Middle East conflict, I think there is a new emerging sensibility of, of, of a new Jewish identity, which has got nothing to do with being victimized or being a uh, part of a ghetto, but has got to do with masculinity soldiering, uh, being uh, immersed in agriculture and the land. So, you know, in the, in the same way, there has been a development of the way black characters are portrayed, especially since 12 years a slave. I think there's certainly an evolution in the terms of the way Jewish characters are being portrayed, uh, uh, possibly with a bit more realism now. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, Alex, but that's what I think the evolution has been. It was more throwing it out for discussion rather than yeah. you know, a question to which was a, a, a clear answer. Just to say to everyone, this is a man who's a wonderful novelist. You should read his books. Okay. I wasn't uh, asking for a plug. Can, I, can <laughs> I ask the question yes. now? Yes. Can you hear me now? No, oh, thank, yeah, thank you. Ahead. Thank you. Uh, some people wanted to know, uh, were uh, talking about the portrayal of women. And I was wondering whether, uh, do you think that Shy Shylock hurt and vulnerability uh, is due to the way he was treated by the others or um, his main hurt and vulnerability comes from something which is his flesh and blood and that is his daughter. 
Uh, it, it's a very when, when you just a moment uh, when you when you portray him, do you take that that innate hurt into account more than uh, the way other treats you? Because I am Jewish, and my experience is that in a way nobody uh, can uh, can uh, reject me without my consent. So here we're talking about his daughter, Jessica, a very schizoid character, very, very ruthless. And what she did to him is quite unbelievable. Do you take this into account when you portray uh, Shylock? Yes, I think Shylock's treatment at the hands of um, Belmont Jessica. and the Venetians and what happens to Jessica the way she runs with uh, runs away with Lorenzo and his treatment uh, clearly influence uh, his aggression and his defensiveness and his need to retaliate. But putting that aside, inherent within the character, notwithstanding all these other social influences, there does seem to be something that is innate. And mm -hmm. I think that is the thing that troubles me about Shylock. He's not only reactive. And interestingly, if people are intrigued by the idea, there is a wonderful book called Shakespeare is Shylock. Mm. The writer explores the similarities between Shakespeare and Shylock. And I think to get an, you know, a deeper understanding of the Merchant of Venice and possibly a deeper understanding of, of Shakespeare who felt as a Catholic, he felt he was an outsider, not entirely accepted in the same way that Shy Shylock isn't. It's actually a fascinating read. So just to answer your question more fully, um, I think Shylock is driven by a sense of uh, resentment and revenge. But what troubles me as a performer are the stereotypical qualities that exist outside of that. Okay, there's another question by David Wich. David, please go ahead. Hi, Paul. Hi, everybody. Paul, that was amazing. Thank you very much. I was learned a lot about you that I didn't know. Your, um, your your life as an actor. I'm going to just um, I'm going to try and sort of pull this away a little bit from the theatre uh, and film performance and try and and perhaps looking at acting Jewish from a more personal perspective. And given your re resolutely kind of secular upbringing, is there any part of you, maybe perhaps as you get older, that feels the need to claim or discover more of your Jewish heritage? A kind of acting more Jewish as you get older, if you like? Um, <laughs> good question. Um, you know, I, I think my, my sister and her husband are on, on this thread as well, and, and they will know this as well, is that Although I grew up in a, we, we grew up in a very secular uh, home, a very politi politicized and secular home, there was always a quite a powerful sense of Jewishness in terms of the narrative of 20th century history. Um, and in a way, uh, uh, as a performer and as a human being, I, it's, I've never been embarrassed about my Jewishness. I've never hidden it, but I've never wanted it to play a significant role in who I am, because I think it's ultimately uh, irrelevant. There's the thing. However, because of global politics over the last four or five years, and this ties into something that I said earlier on, if somebody forces something upon you, you suddenly acquire a kind of rapacious interest in who you are and, you, and, and your background and your past. So there's always the thing of, of, of the foraging around in Jewish identity being driven by something that's can be negative. It can be enriching, but it can be negative. So I, I'm curious about my Jewishness and about my, my Jewish past, but I don't want to be subsumed by it. I think there are, there are far greater things in life to be conscious of and without being trite, um, just being a, a decent, progressive, humane human being should be unconnected to one's ethnicity and religious background. So I don't know if that answers your question, David, but in a nutshell. Cool. Can you take some more questions? They're still- Yes, yes, fine. So maybe I'll come in first and then Rainer Liedke. 
Um, maybe my question has to do a bit with David, which question just before, you know, when we started to discuss your presentation, your performances, you confronted me with these two quotes. You confronted us again by Roald Dahl and George Shaw. And these quotes are quite shocking, yeah, especially quote by Dahl, you don't expect this from him. You also don't expect such a harsh quote from George Shaw either. Now, what do you do if you are asked to play Shaw or Dahl or some, another author who has this kind of quite anti-Semitic background? What do you do in such a situation? I've played a character like that. Um, <laughs> I played Graciano in The Merchant of Venice with, with Alec Guinness as Shylock at Chichester in 1984. Um, and I decided to make, to go as far as I could with the Graciano character to make him as, as viciously anti-Semitic as possible. Um, I played Major Spogler, it was Clara Patacci's bodyguard. I think if character is viciously anti-Semitic and if the narrative is a, a decent one and it's not, it's not promoting anti-Semitism or racism, I have no problem in playing a viciously anti-Semitic or psychopathically racist character whatsoever. It's my job as an actor to make that as real and as, and as believable as possible. No, my, so, my question was not so much about the character, more about the author. You know, when you're asked to play George Bernard Shaw or, or Ryan Dahl, and you know their background is when it comes down to Jews, quite anti-Semitic. Well, yeah, that would, yeah, that would depend entirely on the narrative. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it was a narrative exploring George Bernard Shaw, Ezra Pounds or T.S. Eliot's uh, um, tendency towards making racist comments, I would have no trouble. If the portrayal of that character is vindicating them somehow, I would then have, have a problem. So it all depends on, on context, on dramatic context, I think. Rainer, you are the next one. Rainer Liedke, please. Yes. Um, I mean, stereotyping is all around the media and the arts, and it, it happens all the time. And it doesn't necessarily need to be malicious all the time. Um, in fact, I th I'm thinking about a very nice comedy, light comedy, my big fat Greek, Greek wedding, which is, which is full of huge stereotypes about Greeks. And my wife is Greek and we've seen the film together in Greece and the whole of the country laughed about it. But it wasn't malicious, really. It was just enormously stereotyping. Or I'm thinking about um, Italians, um, due to the mafia being portrayed as the archetypal, archetypal criminal, for example. In fact, your second rendition of Shylock uh, without the costume, I was sort of reminded of, uh, of Marlon Brando in The Godfather, sort of being so somehow devious and everything. And um, I, I wanted to ask you specifically, um, when, you, when you get into character, whether it's a Jewish character or an anti-Semite or any character, how about your own possibly um, resilient stereotypes within yourself when you when you're playing let's say an Italian character you must have some sort of preconceived um, ideas about what an Italian should be acted uh, as or something something similar is that or isn't that the case uh I think ideally an actor's process, whatever part you're playing, is you try and find the humanity in the character. In other words, if you are approaching a stereotypical character stereotypically, you're going to land up with a, with a, with a pastiche, with a performance that is, is not particularly compelling. Um, um, I did a series many, many years ago called Mussolini, The Untold Story with George C. Scott playing Mussolini. And um, he, was, he was brilliant in, in the role. Uh, he, he made him a monster, but he also made him human. So I think you, can't, you, can, you can never afford as an actor when you're approaching a role to judge a character, to objectify. You, you've got to hoop yourself to, the, to, to that character and make that character as believable as possible. So, I mean, unless a character is grossly stereotypical, um, I think it's possible to find some humanity. And I think one has to address one's own prejudice as well, prejudices as well in approaching a character to try and rid yourself of any preconceptions of how that character is. So, you know, the process can be complicated, but ultimately, emotionally, it's quite a simple process, I think. 
there are no other questions popping up, Paul. So shall we bring the official topic part to an end? Okay, great. So my thanks go really out to you, Paul. This was really brilliant. Really, really brilliant. Very Thank happy you. that you agreed to do this. My thanks go also out to our audience for their questions. Very, very super mega interesting questions. And their willingness to participate in this very difficult um, um, debate. Also, I can see Christina says thank you for your inspiring lecture. So you see the very, really, really, it's really great evening. And also my thanks go out to my assistants, Paul mentioned before, without their help, we wouldn't be in a position to do this. To bring Zoom together with film, clips is not such an easy thing. And therefore also my thanks to my team to make this evening possible. I very much hope to see you all again for our next Zoom event, which is going to take place on November the 19th. It's in about five weeks. And the topic is how to dress in Eretz Israel. It's about fashion in Mandate Palestine and how fashion can express modern Jewish Zionist identity in the 1920s and 1930s. So I hope to see you then again. Thanks, Paul. And Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.